Right, I'm going to show you this Aston Martin DB4 um, that was a bit of a surprise to all of us. I thought it would achieve probably a little over half that it achieved. I won't tell you the figures just yet. I'll tell you in a minute when we get up to it. Um, I was pretty convinced because I know what it's worth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's what it's going to make. And most people that were on the telephone, the internet and what have you were expecting to achieve an awful lot less than that. Um, but we had some silly offers. I mean, there's one offer opened up, I think 10,000 quid. I could sell the gearbox for 15,000 pounds. It's, it's silly. Um, so there's always going to be the guys out there that think they're going to steal them, but they're not at the end of the day. There's more guys out there that know what they're worth. Uh, and that was the case this time. Here it is over here. Come and have a look. Now there she is. Now, the thing is, I know it looks awful, but it sits right. There's something about the car, as soon as I saw it, in its, in its location where I collected it, which was almost criminal really, I'll describe it in a minute or two, but as soon as I walked up to it, it sat right, I could see it, it was about right. There was something about it, it we call it a level car, and, and it just sat right and it was a level looking vehicle and it got a little bit better from there um, because in, in, at first glance, I mean, it, the whole situation, the location, the storage area was absolute disgraceful, it basically fallen apart. The, the, the garage it was in, the roof had gone completely and I don't mean part of it. We go into spots um, where you might have a two car garage, which is exactly what this was and the last six or seven feet or something of the roof is all good. In this case, just about everything had gone and it had been gone for quite a long while. So it was quite clear that the owner, um, who I'm told is quite an eccentric old guy, he's not passed away, he's in, he's in a care home, um, but he's uh, obviously an eccentric and <laughs> that's, there you are, that tells you that. Um, he was one of them guys that, that, I bet he never went in the garage. Obviously for, for years it, it's been sat there as I say, with no roof on the garage. And I wouldn't imagine he went down his garden and actually opened the door to the garage. Um, I think he probably just blotted it out and blanked it out of his mind and he never went anywhere near it. Anyway, there it sat at the back end of this two car garage with a Triumph TR7 behind it, which was more difficult to move than this. This actually, the tires more or less pumped up and it moved on a winch pretty well, perfectly. Brakes not stuck on or anything. That's not saying that they want a lot of work, we know all that. Um, behind it was a tree, quite a sizable tree. Uh, a tree that size, really, I mean, that's probably 15, 20 years old, but maybe a bit more. So we had to saw that down before we can get the vehicle out. Various parts were scattered around the back of the garage or in the pit, there was a pit underneath it. The only thing that we haven't been able to find is the prop shaft, but it's not a big deal. We can soon make a prop shaft, that's no, that's no uh, particular worry, but it would have been nice to have found that. But the most important thing is we found things like the grill, um, which um, is, is in the back here somewhere. Uh, yeah, there it is in there. Uh, oh, I can't get it out too easy, but the grill does sit in there. Can you see? There it is. I mean, really important that. Um, you know, kick, kicking panels and kicking strips and that sort of thing were always nice to, uh, to find and that because they're original and they're clean up. But then again, they'll probably be replaced. So, what it was, I had a phone call from the executor, who happens to be brother-in-law, I think, to, uh, to the owner, and said, I've got this Aston Martin sitting in the garage, which I think must be quite valuable. Would you give us an idea what it might achieve? Um, sent a few photos, which you couldn't tell too much. You could just see a DB4 Aston Martin sat in the back of the garage. That's all you could see with this Triumph behind it. Anyway, um, I sent back uh, an, an email saying that almost impossible to value really without seeing it, but uh, most certainly somewhere between 40 and 80,000 quid, um, which I think quite surprised him. I think he was expecting me to say probably 10 or 20,000, something on that line. But it's a DB4, which is, other than things like Zagatos, it's, it's arguably the rarest Aston Martin DB um, that you, uh, that, that's on the market, that's, that's been produced. Um, 
Uh, DB6 plentiful, DB5 or where they're just in the stratosphere, I mean money-wise and that, forget them and there aren't that many of them anyway. But the DB4, I would think there's probably less than any, but I haven't checked figures out, so someone will con contradict me on that. Pardon? There's more than 50 left. 50 left, yeah. is there? There you are, 50 left, yeah. Um, and, and I think, probably, personally, I think it's the most attractive DB range of the Aston market, um, the Aston Martin uh, range of vehicles that were that were um, uh, noted as DBs. I mean, we've got DB1, DB2, DB3, DB3 Mark III, and DB24 Mark III, and so on and so on. All them DBs, right up to DB4, DB5, DB6. Um, and then, of course, it, we, had, we had a bit of a break, I suppose, and then we went to, to the, uh, um, the DBSs, uh, and then back on to DB7s, DB9s, and so on. But I think most people will agree that, that this is probably the most elegant DB of, of, of the era, mainly, I think, because of the front wings. They're, they're very, very Ferrari front wings. They're not cut away like the later ones or set back. They're very pronounced, very, very much protruding, as you can see. And I think that's what makes the car, together with the back end, um, with a short boot, real short boot, and this lovely back end, stylish rake on the back window and such like. I think, add that lot together, and I think that's what makes the DB4 the most desirable of the 1950s, 60s Aston Martins, leaving out Zagato, of course. They also tell me that if you're gonna have a, a Zagato hand-built, which again, you're talking about two million quid value at the end of the day, it's the DB4 you need to base it on. So an awful lot of people, I'm told, maybe not an awful lot of people, some people have been buying DB4s to spend five or six or seven or eight hundred thousand pound on, even a million quid, on having a Zagato body hand-built and grafted on to this car, um, because you do need this as a basis, simple as that. And then you're talking about 1.8 or two million quid. So whichever way you look at it, it, it sounds an awful lot of money, which I haven't told you yet what it achieved. Well, I will do, I'll do that now. I genuinely thought it would achieve 80,000. That's where I thought. And the reason I thought it would achieve 80,000 is because that's what it's worth. And I don't think there were many people could argue about that. Um, I didn't expect it to achieve 145, which sounds to me um, top money. But then you start analyzing it and you think 145,000 pound purchase price. If you spend 300,000 pound on it, Take, going, to, going to take you to 450,000 and that then the car would be as it left the factory. If you put that money in your pocket today and went out to look for a DB4, you wouldn't find one as good. You'd have to spend that sort of money anyway. You could find one at maybe 300, 350, but it wouldn't be in the condition that this car will be when it's restored. So it actually stacks up. If it could have been bought for 80,000, which is bang on its value, in my opinion, it would more than stacked up, no question about it at all. But anyway, it didn't, and this is the end result. So we all, or I don't, but an awful lot of people think, oh, the gentleman who's bought that must be mad, must have more money than sense. No, 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 he's got a lot of sense, and he realizes that you might not make anything out of this vehicle, and at the end of the day, there, at the end of the day, it's sitting looking absolutely magnificent in your garage and it might owe you £50,000 more than what it's worth. But when you come to classic cars of any type, especially this calibre, having a car that owes you £50,000 more than what it's really worth is good business. That's great. There are a lot of people out there would love to be in that situation because there's an awful lot sitting with cars worth 200,000 that actually owe them 300,000. So they're 100,000 pound out of bed. Um, so it actually does stack up. So I quite rate the car, rate the deal. We're really pleased to have got it. Um, it's a feather in our cap to find it. We had a, a, a real interesting day getting it out. Uh, and and I, must, I must say a big thank you to Lodge's coaches they're friends of mine down in Chelmsford who got involved with the extraction of the vehicle um, and uh, Robert, Andrew um, and their friend came along to help me get it out. And it's a good job they did because it saved me a day. I, it would have taken me a day to have got this out and loaded. With them guys there, we've done it in half a day. Um, so 
great thanks to them, really brilliant lads. They brought their, their transporter down together with a spec lift and all the rest of it and it made the extraction so much easier. Um, I think, I haven't spoken to the vendor yet, I, um, I have been asked to give him a call and I will do later on today or tomorrow when Gregor gets back. I gather he's very pleased, uh, I can't imagine him not being. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, I'm looking forward to see his reaction. But in general, I know it looks a lot of money, I know it looks awful, but financially, believe me, it does stack up. Do we know the buyer? Do you think we'll see it again in future? Um, I don't know the buyer. I doubt it. He'll be, I would have thought, he, the buyer would be a private individual, I think. Um, and buyers of this type of vehicle paying the type of vehicle he's, uh, sorry, paying the type of money he's just paid to buy this vehicle, um, I would think this will be his purchase for the next 10 or 15 years. I don't think he'd be buying loads more. Um, but, you know, again, back to this restoration, there's two or three firms out there that will restore this to the, to the, within an inch of its life, and it will be absolutely magnificent. They'll charge for it, like I say, £300,000, whatever it might be. Um, but the beauty of doing it as well is that if you're going out this afternoon, I sort of touched on it earlier, I don't want to go over old ground, but if you're going out to buy a DB4 this afternoon, you better put 400,000 in your pocket because you're probably going to have to spend it. Um, you might get away with 300 and you'll be, have to be satisfied with what you find. But with this, this guy who's bought it, he can give a restoration company 50 grand and get on with it. And then end of the year or, or, or next spring, he can give them another 50 grand and get on with it. So stage payments are really important to some, it's cash flow. Uh, I'm not saying he hasn't got 300,000 pounds to give them straight off, but he doesn't have to. Um, so that makes it stack up quite well. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing it done. I know the TV people, uh, uh, um, Air TV, um, UK TV will be really looking forward to seeing it. I mean, it's gonna be a two or three years, we know that. But you just wait until you see it when it's done. You won't believe it's the same car.